Hi everyone, I'm Josh and welcome to Josh Wright Piano TV. Today I wanted to go over a very niche concept which is rapid, broken, moving octaves. So about nine months ago, John emailed me and he said, will you cover this broken octaves portion of Liszt's transcription of Schubert's Earl King? So this is the measure and I don't play this piece, so I'm just gonna go slow here and then we'll speed it up in the video. Okay, so, and we'll mostly focus on the right hand because left hand's pretty easy. Okay, so how do we get that looser and more accurate like that? So um, basically, how do we not completely derail? I have a few practice methods that I've used with my own students and in my own practice. I haven't, even though I haven't played this, I've had very similar passages with rapid jumping intervals such as La Campanella, which we've gone over on this channel. How do we get those intervals really solid? And I hope the things that I share today can help you if you are having any trouble with passages like this. The first thing that I like to do is do an eyes closed rendition. So, and I'm gonna do a substitute fingering. I'm gonna give myself no margin for error. No chance of error, excuse me. So, because I'm literally going to replace the thumb where the pinky just was. Another very similar thing that helps is to practice them blocked so that your hand memorizes what the octave feels like. Of course, we all know what an octave feels like, but when we're rapidly moving, it can be a little bit disorienting. That was the end of the list. This left hand, that was so disorienting to do that very quickly. Very difficult part of the piece. So I find that the blocked portion helps me a lot. And I would do the opposite on jumping octaves. So these, I would, I would not only do what I just showed you with the blocked, I would also do the broken. So for broken octaves, I do broken and blocked. And for blocked chords or octaves, I do both as well. What that does is that gives your hand a better sense of what the movement feels like and also what the static interval feels like. So I, that's step one. What I would do next is I would isolate the shift in the hand. Notice I'm not just doing a straight long, short, long, short the entire time, because if I keep going, that's making it just regular octaves on the way down. So I want to reset at the top. Reset note, sound slow, and then, okay. That's the next step. Additionally, I would do rapid random amounts. So five notes, and then maybe we replay this one, and then maybe replay this one. Sorry. Uh, going to the next measure there. So that's very helpful as well. You could also do seven. So going all the way up and then start at the top. And that really helps. The other thing that I like to do when I'm in these types of situations is I like to realize this is a little bit easier explained with an arpeggio, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that and then we'll reapply it back to this, is to realize that the hand is not just shifting and it's not just replacing. So with an arpeggio, students will often cross or shift only. They'll go only crossing or they'll just shift and they'll jump and that allows opportunity for error. It's a combination of of both when you're playing an arpeggio. So same thing here. Am I just jumping up and over and shifting the hand, locking into this octave? No, I'm not. But am I truly just replacing 
like I was doing in that exercise? No, because that would get too busy and my hand would get too tight. Yes, there's expansion and contraction of the hand, but there's also shifting of the hand. So we want to kind of marry those two concepts together. And again, you can practice, like if you are missing this one each time, you could just start from here and work around it. Oh, until that feels good. Now I'm actually derailing, wow. <laughs> as soon as I said, let's do a mistake there, now I'm making that mistake. Here we go. There we go. Sometimes you need a little break, a little reset. So that is also helpful to kind of marry the concept of shifting the hand up and also allowing the hand to contract and expand without truly replacing it because that can get too busy. But also if you're just shifting the hand only, that can get tight and inaccurate because you're leaving the keyboard and you might hit a wrong note. So marriage of those two concepts is critical. The last thing, this is just a short video today, that I would say is kind of slither along the keys. The less you leave the keys, the more opportunity you will have to not miss notes. So as I go up, I'm not truly dragging my thumb the entire way up, but it almost feels like I'm doing a little bit of that. And same thing on the way down. I'm feeling the hand kind of fold over and almost dragging it. So that can be very helpful. One other concept, uh, a friend had just emailed me, and I don't play this, so you'll have to forgive me. This is going to be rough. But the list Balad, he said he was having a hard time with a student getting these broken octaves. Let's see, this is bar 96. I'm going to just do some sight reading here. This, just, this idea just came to me to do this, so <laughs> excuse the random thought here. And then... So how do we get those broken octaves a little faster? It reminded me of something. I gave him this um, old idea that I had for chromatic scales. If you watch my channel, you may remember that I said, if you can play a trill, you can play a chromatic scale because a chromatic scale is mostly a trill on a conveyor belt. So if you can do this, you can then play this because it's mostly just back and forth. Yes, when we have two white keys in a row, we do have to use the two. We go one, three, one, three, one, two. But that idea of a conveyor belt has ha helped a lot of my students. So you could do the same thing here. If you can teach a student to tremolo here, that can also be helpful. Doing short bursts, and then, and then. Also thinking of the smallest interval. So as I'm going up, the smaller interval is coming down. As I go down, the smaller interval is the octave. So to there, that's just a seventh, that's just a seventh. Also focusing on one note, the top note, and almost like leaning the hand towards that. So that can be very helpful. So um, get your students doing a tremolo and then maybe a short burst and then a tremolo, then a short burst to there. And always overlap your groups. And then, and then, sorry, let's see here. Oh, uh, this is why I'm messing up. I should say this too, is as your thumb needs to go in for that, make sure it's not uh, at the last possible second. You can move your hand in. I also notice that passages like this, or like the Earl King, or like La Campanella, they get much better over time as you're patient with them. So I remember the first time I played La Campanella, it was very disorienting to, I felt like I was tight and jumping random distances, but over time, so while I would do these short bursts like that, I would also do plenty of uh, 
work very slowly like that and feeling the artistry of the line. this piece. I especially love Sergei Babayan's recording of it. If you haven't heard that, I would highly recommend you check that out. So I hope this clears up the question you had, John, and anyone else struggling with broken, rapid, <laughs> moving octaves. If any of you have any questions, my email is josh at joshwrightpiano.com. If you've enjoyed today's video, I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel and like this video or share it with a friend. That helps to get the word out to as many people as we can. I always try to share as many ideas on this channel, work very hard to prepare this content, um, both in the Pro Practice tutorials, the VIP Masterclass series, and this Josh Wright Piano TV series. So running all three of those series gets quite busy, a lot of hard work, but I try to share as much as I can um, to help you in your studies. So hope something in here was beneficial today. I'll leave a few links for a few things in the description below. One of them is for a free webinar containing 10 of my favorite tips to help take your playing to a higher level. These are tips I use every day in my own teaching and practicing. You can register for that for free down below. Uh, I'll leave a couple links for my paid courses, the Pro Practice and VIP Masterclass series that I just mentioned, if you'd like to go even deeper than this channel goes over. And finally, I will leave a link to my gear kit, all the gear I use in this studio to make these videos in case you're wanting to do something similar or make professional recordings or up your videography game. Again, my email's josh at joshwrightpiano.com. Have a great week. Good luck in your practice sessions.